Hello, everyone. Welcome to season one, episode five of the Cube Podcast, the Cube Pod. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. This is, you know, our fifth podcast day. We're getting our wheels uh, on on the tracks here, trying to get a cadence down. Soon we'll be bringing in guests, but this is our weekly podcast. Where we break down what we're watching every week, uh, the most important stories from our lens, the prism of the enterprise emerging tech, and also commentating on some of the major tech trends as the things that we've been covering for 13 years with the Cube and Silicon Angle is now going mainstream. You're starting to see things like TikTok, the impact of data, sovereignty hitting uh, Congress with TikTok, a lot of things to discuss, actually the fallout from SVB, and of course, the ongoing awesomeness and mind-blowing AI impact of what's happening with all this chat GPT, and every single company is getting funded with, with it's got AI in it. AI has continued to blow people's minds. I've never seen anything like it in the history of my life, where people are like literally impacted and freaking out about it in one hand, and everyone's loving it. So Let's get started. Episode five. How you doing? Good, John. How's it going, man? Just finished my breaking analysis. Looking forward to a little cube pod action. What's the breaking analysis uh, this week? What's the topic? It's uh, which companies are most exposed to the uh, banking crisis. I got some new data from ETR. They sent me a uh, pivot table. I've been like squinting through it. I got, if we got time, I'd love to share with you who who's most exposed in a positive standpoint and a negative standpoint. Well, we're going to get into that under our third topic with SVB, the fallout that continues, the, the structural shit happening, all the game-changing um, discussion around VCs, the pile-on on VCs. I saw a bunch of stuff on TV about this, but we'll get into it. But the top story, Dave, is TikTok, which we've been talking about on at least three of our pods that I can remember, maybe all, th all, all four previous ones. But TikTok was in front of uh, our lawmakers, testimony in front of Congress, the CEO shout Cho Chu, uh, who's uh, ex Goldman Sachs guy, taking over bike da bike dances, TikTok mm -hmm. U.S. thing. But he's out there. He got he got battled hard, and and you know, so so very weird. I mean, you know, I I had thought it was going to go off the rails you know, at some point, but it pretty much was out of the gate. But what was more compelling was the pre um, testimony posturing with TikTok. You saw them, you know, pushing a lot of narratives out there around kind of getting ready for the, you know, the China censorship, China control, data hacking, um, you know, the spyware that they put on all the, all the TikToks, all that speculation, but they had news like, oh yeah, we're spending 1.5 billion to house all our U S data on Oracle's clouds and servers. Um, they asked their, their, their top creators to go public and support them. So clearly a ground game of prep, on TikTok's part. Um, and, and I think they're just trying to leverage the fact that it's such a huge popular app. They had one point we're putting out there saying the popularity is so big. We've got 150 million active users. Um, and Axios had an article said it's you know too almost too big to kill, kind of like sounds like the banks, but you know, they're saying it's it's unkillable. While many in the US are, are fearful, people who know what's going on are fearful that TikTok and rightly so they should be fearful is spying on America and essentially providing the the dumbest app on the planet for our kids and people. And that was the sentiment of most of the questioning. I mean, TikTok is a time waste sink. I mean, it's a waste. I mean, you, you could you could literally get sucked into TikTok and, and it happens on Instagram too, where you can just flip through reels for the next, you know, two hours of dead. You killed you killed hours. Yeah. Um and 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 they have an algorithm that they can tweak it. So once they get the dumb content, they feed it to you all day long. And it's just not productive. That's the argument. A lot of pissed off Jen. My daughter's like she's got a huge following on TikTok. She'll get millions and millions of views. She's like, I love TikTok. I'm like, eh, don't go on TikTok. I mean, you know, the thing here is, John, Congress can't agree on anything unless it's sort of this anti-China. Who's tougher on China? I am. No, I am. Let's beat up TikTok. So that was, you know, front and center. You know, I personally, I'm not sure individuals are, are really at risk. But I'm more concerned about the aggregate data because I think China could identify trends. It's you know they were spying on that bite dance was spying on the journalists, so they could look at the big picture and yeah. inject unrest into society based on that data. And you know back to the the lawmakers, the guy from North Carolina, what was his name Hudson, who was asking Chu if TikTok uses Wi-Fi. I mean. <laughs> it's like really remember funny. senator stevens the internet's a series of tubes yes. connected tubes 
they, so, it, it really shows how dumb the lawmakers are with the when they're their line of questioning it's almost embarrassing and anyone watching anyone under the age of 30 has to look at these people and say who elected these people and it really is a disgrace you know i gotta say you know we have a lot of lawmakers that have law degrees we got to start pivoting over to tech degrees or people actually know what the hell they're talking about and i see you know amazon getting a lot of pounding on their side tech companies are getting you know, you know judged and the people who are judging don't even know check anything about the companies or the tech so you know i think it's time that you know this next generation steps up and runs for office you know it's like a, it's a john f kennedy moment you know ask not what you can do the country can do for you join and join join and be part of it because this is that's this just jumped out at me big time again i joke about the tubes comment from stevens about the net neutrality debate but it was kind of on display again this week you know um a real core issue tiktok is a bad app for our country because the chinese are getting data from there and people in the know are knowing it's it's talking back and it's dumbing down of our people and it's got algorithms that support that and that's well understood by people in the know so the answer is simple it's not a failing app like you said your daughter uses it she loves it because she's got millions of views and so that's why she stays there and it gets a lot of traffic so it's simple take the company public spin it out put it in the us if it's oracle or amazon who cares have someone overlook the code and make sure it's run uh, not run by the chinese and they'll yeah. get paid it's a very simple I mean, solution chu didn't have an answer I didn't think for, you know, the bike dance was harvesting data to figure out what, you know, who spying the journalists that were writing negative stories about them. I mean, that was sort of sketchy. Yeah. You know, we'll get to whether or not TikTok should be, you know, shut down. I, I have some thoughts on that. I'm happy to see it get shut down personally. If they want to shut it down, shut it down. But they got to, if, if TikTok has a move here, they should make the move sanitize it for the United States, make a shitload of cash, take it public, everyone's happy, close that door. If not, then there's going to be a lot of FUD and then a lot of, you said, politic politicizing of this and posturing and making the, taking it out of context like all these politicians do to your early early rant on the pod today. But I think that's not a rant, it's the fact. And they're going to continue to politicize it. And at some point, you're going to see Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp or, or new entrant get in there and saying, hey, we're, we'll be the new TikTok. But again, how are they going to get the scale? So I'd like to see competition. I actually would not like to see TikTok shut down, but I think they should do what you know, maybe China would do, force the company to be owned by U.S. Maybe, like you said, spin it out at least 51% to a U.S.-based entity that controls the board and the company. I, I would be okay with that, wouldn't you? I mean, I, I mean, I'm fine with that. I think, I think the issue is the privacy side of it, and it's not like we have nailed privacy in this country. I mean, you, you I know, know, you know, it's like the the we're not a we're not a surveillance state like China. I mean, we have believe in freedom and liberty, and that that means that we want, don't want to be surveilled. That's Patriot Act, we kind of are, yeah. but you know, I mean, NSA, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. After this yeah, pod, it might be Europe, after us. Though, yeah, I mean, a lot of people in Europe had backlash with with cloud when when you know the whole Snowden thing came out. But but I think you know Oracle's pretty pretty reliable cloud. I mean, they do mission critical work. I I, I mean, if look if they want to stick their neck out and certify, uh, uh, you know, in compliance, I'm, I'm all for it. But I agree, it shouldn't be a China owned company. I mean, there's no way. Well, I, I don't, I, I think it's got to be addressed. And I think, again, there's two issues that jump out. There's the threat to China, which is real. And then there's the embarrassment of our Congress, who needs to kind of wake up and get into the next generation. I mean, right now we have LLMs and chatbots emerging with AI. So much stuff's out there getting better. And, and it's, they're in the Stone Age is their question. They don't even know how to, what tech is. It's a huge, it's a huge embarrassment as far as I'm concerned. I think it's not something... You know, even I found out when I was reporting on the Jedi contract when Microsoft was trying to get back in there and Oracle was smearing Amazon. And um, when I was doing that investigative report, Dave, I was I invited a lot of lawmakers off the record. And the general consensus is a young batch of young talent coming up and they're looking at people who like did laws before the Internet was around. And they're still there. Uh, and then even some of the lawyers, they don't fully grok the impact of systems thinking, network effects, data, data sovereignty, um, competitive advantage. I mean, these are concepts that now are have a technology bent to it. And so when you have a global landscape changing, you know, this these are new new generation problems. You know, what do we do? 
about privacy. What about this Chinese company that's kicking ass and like is in the hands of pretty much every American under the age of 20? So that's an interesting policy question. What do you do? Well, it's, I, I mean, I, I like to see the competition. I, I mean, I, I to your point, there's, you know, other companies, whether it's, you know, let's say, let's face it, Facebook is is the obvious one to do this. And, you know, the smear campaign has been reported. You know, their mantra is not do no evil. But, hey, if you can't beat them in the market, you got to beat them, you know, somehow, either with underhanded tactics or in the courts. And like, you know, like they say, if you're not cheating, you're not trying hard enough. It's, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think TikTok was successful in trying to look like the good guys here. So um, there'll be more of this. It's going to be a continuing top story. I mean, it's a pretty kind of weird environment. You got TikTok. Uh, fiasco you get the whole twitter thing going on with elon musk we've been covering the, the collapse of svb bank which we'll get into um you have a lot of people online who are making a lot of noise about kind of new ways to do business new ways to do government so i think we're in this really interesting time and obviously it's recession the, the interest rates just got hiked up 25 basis points earnings aren't looking good at uh, more tech companies laying off Accenture's laying off more stuff um you know that's a huge issue. And, you know, in comes TikTok. And if you if you're young, if you're a young person like your daughter, they're gonna be like, what are you doing with TikTok? We love this app. So again, too big to kill, maybe too big to regulate. These are new new grounds. So, you know, I, I think it's gonna be a huge issue. Huge, what do huge you, issue. What, what do you, when they say too big to kill, you mean they're just they're just so ubiquitous, it's like be like killing Bitcoin or or because it's not too big to fail. It's not like systemic risk, right? It's just what what I, I don't really get that too big to kill. I mean, because I think just... it's a generational thing. You know, we were talking Brendan, our producer and the team here about they're all on TikTok. They spend their lives on TikTok. Um and the younger generation is literally a hundred percent behind it. It's not like the government has been doing great over the past, you know, eight years. Like I don't think there's a lot of sentiment for the younger generation thinking that we're the most, you know, optimized and most efficient government apparatus in the in the history of our situation here in the U.S. We, the it, you know, this, we it's the opposite. It's been going, you know, it's been a lot of, you know, a lot of fighting and and civil un, 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 unrest. So in comes the government saying TikTok, we're going to kill it or ban it. Well, they all use it, right? So it's a generational gap. And this is what I've been saying for many years, Dave. There's a uh, there's going to be a revolution in our country around the younger generation who are going to look at things like our lawmakers and saying, what a bunch of clowns, a clown car. Why aren't there smarter people running our government? And these are good questions, and they should be asking those questions. Let me ask you a question, John. You know, when right after SuperCloud, we did a chat GPT, and the premise that I put forth with Sarv G, and you were there, was that um, open AI won't get first mover advantage. You, you kind of said, oh, I kind of think they will. Um, I, yeah. I've, I've kind of flip-flopping on that. Um, mm -hmm. Do you, so, because I think they're gathering a lot of really valuable data and they're kicking ass right now, but, but it's early. But do you think, does TikTok have a first mover advantage? Because I mean, everybody can do this AI thing, but TikTok came out and they were feeding videos like no other uh, social platform had done before. Do you think they have a sustainable first mover advantage? TikTok? Yeah. Well, I mean, they weren't the first mover. They were just the largest scale mover of of the of the format. But they were um, the first to do like AI and yeah, yeah, the format, but not yeah. so much the format, but the way in which they would serve videos to you was was different it, versus, you know, hey, this is what your friends shared. It was more, you know, understanding what your interests are and then serving yeah, I mean, videos. Dave, you, you and then know. the second thing they did, by the way, was as a creator, they would juice your video. So they would give you like the inject a cocaine injection. Oh my God, I got this what happened to my yeah. daughter. Oh my God, I got like hundreds of thousands and millions of videos. I love TikTok. Yeah. And they would hook you and then they, they would tease you. Like the next one, maybe you wouldn't get as much. So they make you work harder. It was like a gaming yeah. theory. It was it was brilliant. Yeah, that's called that's crack. what I mean by first that's, mover. That's crack it's called crack. That's called drug, drug injection. But that's what um, I mean by first mover advantage. That they were the first to introduce that. Now everybody's doing that, right? Well, you know, this came up with Facebook when they got criticized for being kind of like that viral, you know, growth hacking, they called it. That growth hacking was really kind of founded by the Facebook generation. TikTok perfected it. And they perfected it with mobile and they perfected it with the short format. They had great tools for creators to do stupid stuff on their phone and add animation and other elements to their messaging and storytelling. And it got riveting for people and it just spread like wildfire. So that one was the format was great. 
two, they had the growth hack of all time with the algorithm and then just snowball from there. Whether they're pumping fake views to make people think that they're stars, next influencer, you know, that could be going on too. You know, Tyler, my no, son, I, he had the I, big he had the big hit on TikTok. I remember he his song was I, the one behind the Vivi dance. You know, I think the, they're real views. Ago. I think they're real views. They just promote it. Like you remember, you remember how Justin TV used to promote the cube? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how we page. got started. <laughs> well, I, I think they're going to have an advantage. Like I said, they're too big to kill, but they could be, you know, managed. And that's why I think they they should just divest from ByteDance, the parent company uh, in China, and have a U.S. subsidiary that's independent and goes public, has board members, has servers in the U.S. There's some sovereignty there, and it's uh, just game over. They make a, they make a lot of money, goes over to the coffers in China. And they move on. Or the other choice is to shut it down, which, as we said, there'd be a revolt. If you'd be against it, it's kind of that would be like a serious policy. Now, if the U.S. could prove that lives were killed and that there was a Chinese, you know, uh, kind of cyber war um, element to this, then they could shut it down immediately. Um, well, well, but how about like the brand name investors, KKR, you got SoftBank in there, Sequoia, <laughs> General Atlantic. I mean, it's like. Wow, it's like a who's who. I mean, where are they on all this? <laughs> they got to be lobbying hard, make sure that doesn't happen. So, of course, what would you do? Yeah, yeah, you got you got a, the hottest app on the planet, the biggest numbers, growing, still growing with good technology. Um, the issue is, is transparency. I mean, they got they got the platform, they got the content providers, um, they got the traffic. They just got to get focused on the transparency, um, and that's killing them right now. And th and then the fear mongers kick in. And say, you know, it's China watching your every move. And so, how much is that true? Probably not a lot of it, but I think there's definitely ties to China. And I, I would, I'm suspect of, uh, of this being kind of a planted malware in our society, you know. And this is the new era of cyber and geopolitical. The, the world is flat. This is what it looked like. So, so you know, our government's got to step up, and our people have to step up and and either educate them, elect people in there that know what the hell they're talking about, because the people on TV who are spewing nonsense, they're all activists. There's no real, you know, authentic point of view here other than people taking sides against something. So I think it's a generational thing. And that's, I come back down to it. That's why I kind of focus on the tubes from Senator Stevens, because this was that moment for that everyone from 18 to 30 who didn't see that that clip uh, or, or understand that, that's going on in the digital world right now. So this is a real force. Um, you know, this is where, one area where I think China has an has a potential advantage in, in in public policy, even though their public policy is onerous, is that you remember when um, Alibaba was going to you know spin out the ant and 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 China just the Chinese government just shut it down. They didn't go and get permission from Congress. They didn't really debate. They just shut it down. And so the U.S. to your point, the U.S. is like, well, what do we do? And it it all becomes politicized. Oh no, I I'm hardliner on China. No, I'm the harder liner on China without really an understanding of what should be done and how it should be done. That's really not what doesn't seem to me anyway what the discussion should be. I think you and I could solve this. Just like you said, spin it out, make it US based <laughs> and be done with it. And you yeah. get all these investors behind it. And yes, that's it. exactly. You figure yeah. out the commerce for this next generation. You got large scale, hyperscale clouds. You got the rise of AI. And you're talking about AI and, and open AI. And you, when you asked the question to me about scale and first mover, um, the, and I said, I think it's a first mover advantage. We, we debated you're kind of coming on that side, but still unknown. But I'll, I'll tell you this, Dave, I'll tell you this. What's interesting is, is that if you look at the, the premise of our discussion around can open AI and chat GPT survive, I mean, they are innovating at rapid speeds, so you got to give them serious props on the execution. Yeah. The, the thesis that we were putting on the table was, what's it cost to replicate? Is it inimitable? Can it be imitated? How fast? And our discussion was, my point of view was, scale drives the competitive advantage, the differentiation. Well, today, Databricks announced Dolly, which is a democratize the open model. So, so Databricks just launched um, a new way to train, to give chat GPT-like functions uh, to, to follow. So, you know, Databricks, which you did a, a critical post on and challenged their future, just released this thing called Dolly, a cheap to build LLM that exhibits a surprising degree of instructions following the capabilities exhibited by chat GPT. Feed it data and you use this open source tool. So 
there it is. There are, you're starting to see more copycats coming out. And the question is, will it work? So if you check out Dolly from Databricks, you'll see all the coverage. Just check out the, uh, let's see what the coverage looks like right now. I mean, this is in real time. Of course, Silicon Angle has it. We've been on yep. top of it. Wall Street Journal. Um, essentially, everyone wants to be the chat GPT. In fact, the Cube is coming out with Cube AI, Dave, which is going to be our Cube GPT. Um, and that's going to be spun out. And so we're going to, we're going to do the same thing. So it's, it's, it's easy to get into the game. It's hard to master it. So that's my new updated position on, on chat GPT. I think you're going to see a lot of copycats. It's the question is who can use the data at scale and who actually has the right data to make the AI work. And then the second thing is, is that can you keep growing it? And I think where people will fail is they won't know how to either provision the infrastructure to get it done and they won't know how to operate it and they might not they might not use the data well so i think open ai will continue to have an advantage and then the the macro condition will be whether the one large language model ruling the world if that's the, the paradigm they'll win everything but i don't think that's going to be the case it's going to be a large language model with chat gpt and a series of foundational models there'll be an ecosystem map and we're already seeing thousands of startups hit the scene. Reuters is posting here today. Um, the, the 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 sequoias of the world. Everyone's pumping in in deals with, with AI. So as we as predicted here on the pod, well, the startups here, are rolling in. I, I'll say again, AWS turned the data center into an API, and and ChatGPT sort of created turned the corner on the era of turning technology into a human language interface, and. We talked about this last week. Microsoft went from like being at the back of the pack from a, a tech perspective to number one business model. I, I mean, I, like I said before, I kind of want to flip flop on my flip flop on my commentary that OpenAI won't have first mover advantage. I, I think, I think right now it's it's their lead to lose. It's moving so fast, and the history of tech generally favors disruptors. And this marriage with Microsoft is is interesting. Um, is is OpenAI to Microsoft what DOS was to IBM? In other words, can OpenAI, you know, do a reach around at some point? Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Well, it's it's funny. I think I think it's going to be a needle mover and a game changer at the same time for whoever can harness the technology. And one of the things that came up was is that can can um, is ChatGPT a Google killer? Or an Amazon killer, because if you think about it, with Microsoft involved with Azure, you know Howie Shu, who's one of our Cube alumni, is always on the, on on our show. We should yeah. bring him on for a pod to talk about this. Commented on the SuperCloud event we had that he thinks it's more like Amazon Web Services. He thinks that OpenAI and ChatGPT will have more of an AWS effect, an enabling effect, not so much a monolithic application per se. Which is interesting observation. It's contrarian to what was going on at the time. But if you look at the success of chat GPT from a consumer standpoint, clearly off the charts, the numbers are off the charts. It's, it's a browser moment, iPhone moment. That's what people are saying. And we feel the same way, but the backend value that Microsoft's getting out of this is significant. So, you know, it's more that this is more of an infrastructure. And I, and I talked to him this morning on text. I asked him what, what he thinks about the changes. He saw our article on Silicon angle and your interview with um, um, Cisco uh, J2 at um to Patel, yeah. Patel at, at, at Mobile World Congress, where you he was talking about AI. I was just how he used to be a big engineer at Cisco. He commented to me online just now and said, the uh, the OS application model is out and in is the LLM chatbot model. So the old days was operating system application. Now the new model is LLM foundation model and chatbot and AI app. And so if you if you think about that, that completely abstracts away the OS and the concept of software as an application. So, so uh, how as you said for you know, hundred million you get open AI. Remember he said that at SuperCloud too. And then you know Andy Tarai from Constellation texted me or emailed me. I can't remember. And he was saying that Stanford researchers replicated ChatGPT for like you know six hundred and thirty dollars or something versus I think it was four or five million to, you know for ChatGPT to train the model. So his point is you can train these models very inexpensively your point is but you got to have scale so that scale is is what matters but this this goes back to the original premise of that breaking analysis that we did which which is it's not going to be that expensive to create competition but i again i think microsoft with the business model 
you know, has an advantage. So, so it's, it's the chat GPT, but it's other AI and the other factor in all this is, is influence, right? So, so this week, Trump was supposed to get arrested and it was a big meme all over the internet. Mid journey, which is an AI application for images. Very popular, very cool. V5 is that version five is out. It's, it's spectacular. Images can be doctored now so in an amazing way that you can show things. So those pictures going around the internet where Trump was actually getting arrested, they're all doctored, all fake. So I started digging into it and mid-journey has censorship problems. So they're omitting words. So for example, I discovered from a source, and I'm not sure if this is reported. I know in Reddit, they took the threads down off Reddit. Um, Mid Journey is an SF company, by the way. The China, China, certain China words are, are banned. Chairman Mao is banned on on Mid Journey. You can search Trump, you can search all these guys, but you can't search anyone from China. Okay, they're banned. And and then the Reddit threads were deleted. Okay, really? so censorship on Mid Journey. Okay, President Xi censor prompts are gone. They're banning the words. The Reddit thread that's you can find it on Google search. If you type mid journeys Chinese censorship, it still shows up on Reddit. The thread is disabled. So there's a lot of shit going on behind the scenes with this whole TikTok, open AI. And you know, what is mid journey good for right now besides having great AI? Manipulation, misinformation. So the Trump thing was funny, but people who aren't in the know could think that's real. Oh, there's so much at stake. I mean, how many times have you been like texted from somebody on either the left or the right to see? And you look into it and you're like, okay, this is like bullshit. <laughs> you know, you're like, <laughs> you bother just fact checking? I mean, this is nonsense. And like, oh yeah, okay. Let's see. But, I'm getting a text from from Brendan here about mid journey. It was, oh, the Reddit thread. It's still up there. No, there is a Reddit thread on there. Thanks, Brendan. Appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting with it the influence. The, the question is, is that you know, it, it was that banned because they were forced? They want to make that make sure they get good market share in China from a user standpoint, or is that banned because of some influence? You know, that's this whole what is real and what is censored is going to be a big thing. I think there's going to be kind of an arbiter coming out of this. Is going to be you know, um, new methods that are going to be opportunities for entrepreneurs to say, hey, I'm going to be the seal of content approval. You know. FDA approved like food, you know, like yeah, this is some cube approved, you know, or something where people can say, hey, you know what? Let the information flow, but there needs to be some sort of vetting. How about um, how about they do that for congressional hearings? Like they put somebody who knows what the F they're talking about there. And if somebody opens their mouth and asks a dumb question or doesn't understand anything, they can just mute their mic or pull them off the stage. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think that's a great point. I mean, the whole brings the point of the structural process of why even have Congress hearings in the first place. You do a virtual event with experts, you make it public, you make it completely free, you make it completely transparent, live stream it, you get the data, then you bring it into the chambers, and then it becomes a much more substantive group conversation. Why can't people participate? Why can't citizens participate virtually in the hearing? Why can't there be some collective intelligence or some sort of workflow? And, and if there isn't, that's the problem with, with digital right now. It hasn't evolved yet to be truly group productivity, and that's coming. I believe that's going to be a huge area that no one sees coming. We'll and see you that. know why? It's because it eats minutes on the political agendas. Right? Oh, it makes this, it makes Congress a stage of parody, basically. It's like the Tonight totally. Show. It's like the Daily Show to me. It's like, it's, it's like a joke. So uh, I think that's very key. But someone will build software that's going to be kind of asynchronously made for people to participate and contribute to the conversation with substantive value, not get buried below the noise. So, you know, I think there's going to be a real movement for someone who can extract the signal from the noise constantly. And and can he put that out there? Of course, we do our part best we can. But, you know, someone with bigger cash, billions at play, that can build a media system that is inclusive, that actually gets the truth. That's to me going to be the kill. And I think that's going to be the younger generation is, is going to come out, come out of this. I mean, the fact that hundred percent of the people behind TikTok is proof. It's proof that the generations have to evolve. Well, this gets back to your, your, you know, too, too big to, to fail, too popular to fail. Right. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's ubiquitous. It's like, you know, the government trying to kill crypto. <laughs> you're not going to kill crypto. <laughs> you're just going to miss out on the innovation, but you're not going <laughs> to kill crypto. 
Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into the next block. B, the B block here, Dave. Let's get into the let's get into the next discussion. Um, the A at Chat GPT has a rival, Bard, and you saw the open news with Databricks. Uh, honestly, we interviewed uh, AnyScale, which is a company out of um, Berkeley that provisions LLM infrastructure. Um, uh, the founder is a first-time founder, uh, Robert Nishimara. Great guy. We interviewed him on the Cube. Uh, and you got Ali Goshi. Matai over there, all the Databricks guys are all smart. Berkeley's got a ton of people coming out of there. Every school in computer science probably has great people looking at this. AI is the hottest topic in the planet. And yeah, people are weirded out by it. I've never seen people on Facebook and all my social channels commenting in such a diverse, weird way. Some people are super excited. Some people are rabid uh, fans. Some people want, are very concerned about privacy. Some are freaked out, don't know what to expect. Some people are saying it's causing them anxiety. That's weird. Well, I've never heard that before. Really? I mean, more so than social media? I social mean, media I, kind of snuck up on everybody. <laughs> you know, I mean, social well, media wasn't like a, a shock to the system. Like AI. This no, AI right. seems more like a shock to the system than Facebook. Facebook like, was a slow roll. Just like, well, Facebook was like, like whoa, this is really cool. I, I, only yeah. students can get it. Okay, I'll, I'll use yeah. my you know, college ID and get in, you know, email and get in. Wow, this is really cool. Hey, oh, uh, you know, high school reunion coming up. Let's see if we can find people. And all of a sudden it's like, yeah. <laughs> well, they and they also grew their tech. They, they also grew their tech. They had the graph databases. They had the uh, Facebook Connect. That Amazing failed. tech. They, Amazing tech. Well, you some can of it, upload some, photos so fast to Facebook. It's just incredible. I mean, it's just well, Instagram. Well, my point. My bar, point. But... My point. Actually, the tech wasn't that good. There was a lot of fails in areas. So the growth wasn't there. But Instagram grew like a weed, right? So yeah. that was a, that was interesting, right? So, and that was even wasn't even part of Facebook until they bought it, but. Instagram just grew like a weed. So, but that was not a shock to the system because it was photos. Yeah. I think AI, yeah, is, and friends. It, AI yeah. is a mind blowing shock to the brain. Like, holy shit. And the stories out there, like um, if you're a lawyer or you're an accountant uh, doing taxes, you're a, um, if you're a content person, that chat GPT puts you out of business. And, and John, that's, you remember, oh, go ahead. Sorry. And well, that's the conversation that's going on. That's one level. Then the other one is, is this is weird. Like, oh my God, like, what's it mean to me? Um, and so, so there's a lot of that happening. So you remember in, in YouTube's er, earlier when SBB was melting down, you were like, this is as bad, if not worse than the, the dot com. And, and you remember well, after the dot com, you had just moved out there. You know, I had traveled out there. It was empty. Uh, and then it, it took till 2004 was the Google IPO was like a catalyst for tech coming back. And you know, I, I I don't I don't know if it's going to last as long, but I do think there's a there's an analogy here, a parallel, in that AI you know, could be that that boosting that tailwind. You know, character AI raised 150 million dollars as a billion dollar valuation. You know, everybody's AI washing. Nvidia is going through the roof. I did some analysis on that, which I think it that frankly looks over overbought yeah. to me. But hmm. but but it's because of AI, right? Um, yeah. UiPath had a had a great quarter, and you know one would think, okay, hey, there's a concern that AI is going to affect RPA and automation, but UiPath turned it into an advantage. They had a good quarter, and they're saying, hey, we're all over AI. That I think props up the company, and so I, I think this AI could get a little bubblicious, you know, to use a term that we like to throw around. Yeah, but I think actually the the market right now needs some positivity, sustained positivity, and AI could could be that. The other thing I'll, I'll just add is is that I do think AI is going to have a productivity impact. I don't know when it's going to show up in the numbers, but I but I, I it's, AI will be deflationary, uh, in in my mind. It could hurt some jobs too, but I think generally tech is deflationary, and AI is going to supercharge that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot in there to unpack, but I think your comment about the dot com bubble. Uh, transition was an interesting point. And I think we're in that now. And I would double down on my my initial position on this and say that I think even more, it's a bigger factor. I think it's a, it's a combination of the dot-com bubble, okay, and the 2008 multiply by 100, okay, in terms of impact. I'll tell you why. When the dot-com bubble hit, and there's a lot of conversations, but specifically on my point is, is that it really was the internet turned into the web and the web got bubbled up as you said, and then burst. During that bursting period, people realized that the online population of people using the internet was growing. So there's still a statistic or KPI called online user, 
Okay. And the numbers were growing because the connectivity started also increasing um, speed wise and you had music going online. So you had the generational shift of the web truly yielding the value of the World Wide Web. And then you had that, that bubble period bursting, which caused the nuclear winter, as we call it here in Silicon Valley. And then that 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 fertilized the next crop of 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 movement. That was the web 2.0. That was, you know, different uh, user interfaces, Ajaxes of the world. You had social networks emerging, podcasting. I did that venture. You had all kinds of rethinking. Blogging emerged. You started to have this kind of sharing culture. That was the beginning of this democratization. And then in comes mobile. Okay, with the iPhone in 2007. So between 2002 and 2007, you got wireless. I mean, there was a time where you couldn't get 5G or any G. It was simply phones and text messages. And I remember when Wi-Fi came out, we were driving down the freeway doing the first ever Wi-Fi thing on the freeway. We were like blown away and we're looking at packets move on the command prompt. So so there was no Wi-Fi back then, right? And even cellular had no, no speed. That changed everything. Okay. And then in comes mobile phone. Then you get the mobile revolution. Fast forward today. Yeah. You got some advances. You got crypto. The crypto bros are still out there pushing that, which I, I'm bullish on still. But this AI thing is going to be, I think this is where this bubble bursts. We're going to be in a recession. It's going to burst. It's going to be tons of layoffs. That's the fertilizer. That nuclear winter that's happening now is the fertilizer for that next level. And I think if you look at the success right now, this AI trend is changing the application model, as I pointed out from how we choose comment, OS to app to LLM to chatbot. That's a paradigm shift. The successful companies that are AI first and or cloud native are accelerating faster and are more agile. And I think you're starting to see proof points that those winning hands are the talent, the formation, how they're organized is all changing. That is structural. And I think that's going to be a major inflection point. And everyone's going to be on either one side of the street or the other, the loser side and the winning side. And the winning side is AI, new coding, new capabilities, cloud native, open source, um, new applications. So that's what's happening. So all the people who were like pre-AI are pretty much dead as far as I'm concerned. If they don't retrofit their business or refactor, um, then they're done. And, you know, I always like to quote Moneyball, Dave. And there's a scene in Moneyball where Billy Bean is that talking to the Red Sox owner uh, and Brad Pitt. And, and the owner says, the first guys through the wall are bloody. But if if every company's not rebuilding their business and their comp their ball teams based on your model, the A's Moneyball model, they're going to be extinct. A couple of years later, the Red Sox win the World Series because they adopted it. So that is kind of what's happening now. People are looking at it going, I got to refactor my business with AI. If not, they're going to be dinosaurs. So, well, and, uh, and that's that's the, that is to me like absolutely happening. But and so, so to take your Moneyball analogy, which is a good one, what the Red Sox did is they applied Moneyball for the upper tier players because what what happened with the Oakland A's is it worked great during the regular season, but it failed them in the playoffs because they didn't have a Derek Jeter, and you know Derek Jeter made like an unbelievable play and then went on, and while well, Oakland just watched. So Red Sox <laughs> applied that. With, with but they spent money on it and and that you know what you're saying is really interesting you, you, i would describe it like this from 1996 to 2000 the hype was the potential of metcalf's law but you didn't have the scale economies which is like which is why pets.com you know for instance failed they didn't have the scale they had a billion billion dollar valuation but now you got chewy very successful it's got a 14 billion dollar valuation and basically the same idea so you've got metcalf's law in place you've got the cloud You've got all this technology. You, you, you know, you've you've got security. You know, which is a, a sort of a two-edged sword here. But so I guess I'm thinking. My thinking, John, is that the cycle is going to be accelerated, or, or yeah, the cycle is going to be compressed. But the big wild card to me is the era of free money. We've lived in a decade of basically zero interest rates and quantitative easing, easing, and that's ending. Um, I think. It's no, really, no. It, it, Again, it's it's the nuclear winter. It's happening. So, I mean, this is what we're we're buckering down for. But in every nuclear winter, okay, there's always a massive slingshot seesaw, whatever you want to call it. You call it seesaw. There's going to be a slingshot of uh, exceptional startups, exceptional different stuff coming, building mm -hmm. on the existing. So, um, I, I'm I'm watching. I think it's going to be a good thing. So, again. <laughs> by the way you mentioned bob medcalf he just got the uh he's a living legend you know you've known him for a long time yeah. he just got awarded the turing award the highest honor in computer science he invented ethernet for the folks who don't know bob medcalf is 
which is the foundation of all today's computer networks. The competing network um, protocol was token ring IBM had, which was two megabits per second. Bob invented 10 megabits per second, which became the thesis of everything that we have on the planet today for in networking. So uh, amazing guy. Um, I remember he used to predict the internet was going to crash and it was his way. <laughs> it was his call to arms for the industry to get its shit together. Yeah. And he actually did, you know, by by those prognostications, which didn't come true really. I think yeah. he did the industry a lot of good. But 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 to your back to your moneyball analogy, you know, the Red Sox, it worked, but then everybody sort of copied that. It was kind of an oh way hey, open system. And then you saw some of these, you know, small market teams, you know, Tampa, for instance, were, were able to win. So I guess my question back to you is, you know, who's going to win this big race? Is it going to be these new disruptors that you're talking about? I mean, history would suggest, the history of tech suggests that the that the the dominant players almost always get disrupted. But yeah, I mean, you look at Microsoft. Okay, I remember when their stock was in their twenties um, when Ballmer was still there. They they have an opportunity to be that Apple like thing because Apple, remember the Apple turnaround didn't just happen with the iPod and the iPhone. They had already cleaned up the Mac side when Jobs took over. So I think you know Microsoft could be that next generational player. They're going to win because they have a good early run with Azure, and that's a threat to AWS. And we'll see how they respond. I said that before. Um, Amazon has an opportunity because they have chops in AI. Will they make the right moves? That's going to be a big watch there. Can Amazon I mean make it? Yeah, the Amazon business, it's a, it's a wholly different animal, isn't it? I mean, the cloud business, we know well, love the cloud business. I mean, I'm not as optimistic about the retail business because it's never really made that much money, if any money. And it's got this disruption scenarios to Amazon's retail business. They have all oh. these warehouses. And, and I think, what if AI makes it really easy to uh, to eliminate the need for warehouses where you could ship directly from like like uh, Alibaba does ship directly well, from online your, your online user. retail or physical retail I mean because I I think physical retail is going to be a boom because I think people are going to want to be face to face and look at the blowback from the pandemic I think shopping will be online for efficiency but people will have experience based shopping physically I think another that's disruption be... scenario for Amazon but of course they could you know pivot to to they physical, own the, they but, could own all the physical. <laughs> well, but Walmart does already. I mean, yeah. look at Walmart, right? I mean, so you put an outpost in every retail outlet with a you know automatic provisioning system like they have now with, with cloud grab and go. And, you know, I mean, this is where know. this is where Jassy's big challenge is. I mean, let's face this government issues, etc. Somebody on Twitter, I was arguing the other day. They're like, Ah, oh, Jenny Jassy, horrible CEO. He should go. I saw that. Like, <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you out of your mind? I mean, this guy is like the CEO of the decade. Yeah, this you know, he inherited this this kind of a mess. I mean, Bezos left right at the right time. The question Here, Andy, with ja the question this. with Jassy is is that it's definitely he's a great CEO. First of all, that's that's the, the fact that anyone would say that they don't know what they're talking about. They were just talking about some earnings that are the layoffs that happened. Look, they got too big, like everyone else. They laid off another nine thousand people. That sucks, and that's bad. But the thing is, is that I think Amazon's got so much going on. Jassy's challenge is how does he duplicate himself? Because he's been very hands-on. He likes to get in the weeds on everything. If he has to find a management team that's going to operate that large, large company that it is, and it's like, can, can you imagine being the CEO of Amazon? Okay, there's something going on every day that's a fire alarm. Every day you wake up, there's no day that you're you're going to get rest. Every day, government it's something, unions, it, it, it's know, some fire, man, not a, a barn I mean, fire. It's not like a little small little <laughs> fucking match. It's like huge. You know, we're getting sued by the European Union, uh, or or you know whatever. Some stuff's happening. Unions are forming all over. So it's just, it's hard. Um, but all right, well, let's get into let's get into the next segment. Let's take a break. And come back. We've got a word here about our RSA plug. Let's get that in. Let's come back from the break and we'll dig into the bank fallout. And let's talk about the entrepreneurial landscape at Dave and some of the tech trends we're seeing in the enterprise and emerging tech. We'll be right back after this short break. Hello, everyone. From April 24th to April 27th, the global cybersecurity community will gather at RSA Conference 2023. On the agenda is arming you with the best practices and state-of-the-art solutions to keep your organization secure and safe. Experience the countless opportunities to make valuable connections that can open up new doors. Access cybersecurity's biggest innovations and cutting-edge ideas during the four days of sessions, keynotes, skill-building experiences, and more. Don't miss the chance to be stronger together. Visit rsaconference.com slash thecube23 to learn more and register and tell them John and Dave sent you. rsaconference.com slash thecube23. Okay, we're back. Dave, 
So we just beat the dead horse on TikTok AI, which we'll continue to do. It's the hottest area. Edge is hot. I love the edge right now. I'm, I'm, I think that the supercomputing show, Mobile World Congress that we've been going to, point to two tell signs in the next 24 months. You know, the convergence of hardware, silicon, uh, compute, gear, and software in the cloud are going to come together. You know, you see AI. the telco, AI, telcos it, configuring it. It's just, uh, it's so obvious to me, Dave. But uh, to me too. I mean, we've been talking about this for quite some time now. Honestly, David Floyer is the one who shook me up and turned me onto it. You know, quite a quite a number of years ago. AI inferencing at the edge. Most, most, most model build. Most AI today is model building in the cloud, and it's going to flip. Most of it's going to be real time, inferencing, inferencing at the edge. No humans involved. Machines making decisions. You know, you'll send data back to the cloud, but you're going to have, you know, millions and millions of data points. And as George you know, Gilbert and I talked about this on a breaking analysis, and it's just going to completely disrupt the existing technology landscape from, a, from, this, from the entire stack. Semiconductors, you know, edge devices, the whole software stack, uh, uh, and, and then all, all through the, the data analytics you know, piece of it, new applications. I mean, it's just, it's going to blow away the, the economics, the business models, the speed, the amount of data, the velocity of that data, everything's going to change. I think it's it's you're exactly right. I mean, look at look at the success of the big companies right now. And in fact, I'm looking at a tweet right now. I want to get your thoughts on it. It's, it's from Brian Halligan, from a uh, former HubSpot co-founder. Yeah, the, he compares the top ten tech companies in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley area, to Boston, and the top companies, Apple, two thousand five hundred billion value. Number one is HubSpot, nineteen billion dollars in value. Yeah, so two two trillion. Versus, so the, the number versus ten, what, the, num the number ten on the list is Palo Alto Networks for fifty seven billion, and number ten it on Boston is Car Gurus, two billion. So you got Apple, Google, Meta, Oracle, Cisco, Salesforce, Adobe, Intuit, ServiceNow, Palo Alto in the top ten, and Boston. You got HubSpot, PTC, Paramount Technologies, Akamai, Toast. DraftKings, Pega, Wayfair, TripAdvisor, Rapid7, CarGurus. Hey, you forgot Constant Contact. They're not in there. <laughs> I'm kidding. I mean, it's like, <laughs> okay. it's like this is the East Coast, you know, yeah. best so, of. I mean, it's, so it's, someone it's, said, someone says the Bay Area was founded by gold rushers and the Boston was founded by Puritans. So, Dave, <laughs> what's going on over there in well, your world? You know, John Chambers said it better. When you interviewed John Chambers at his Palo Alto home, he said, <laughs> look, dude, he, John Chambers worked. John Chambers, Joe Tucci, they worked at, at Wang. And the young people, this audience, even the old people don't remember. Wang, Digital Equipment Corp, Corp was the hottest company on the planet. Certainly IBM was the was everything. But DEC, Wang, Prime, DG, Apollo. I mean, these were the, the hottest companies going. And John Chambers said it to you. He's like, look, there's there's no guarantee. And 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 the East Coast, 128 sort of thought it had a right of passage. It didn't. And Silicon Valley just blew it away. And yeah. then, you know, East Coast never really recovered. I mean, it's still competitive, mm -hmm. but it really pivoted to sort of biotech. I mean, I think Austin, New York City is, I would put New York City ahead of, you know, Boston in terms of, of innovation. Uh, Austin is growing like crazy. I mean, even yeah. Southern California, you could, you could argue is more competitive. I mean, Boston's still there, but yeah, you said it's. I think it's the risk take. I mean, to me, you know, I obviously grew up in that, that area, so I, I just say to me, it's risk taking. I mean, Boston had it, had it going on for a while there, but they got cocky and it's just slower. It's more diversified. It's less concentrated in tech. I think Cambridge has got a hot area going on there. Obviously, we know the MIT area, Northeastern. You got the schools there. I'm surprised that there's not more action in Boston. I mean, I know they got the seaports growing, but there's. I don't think there's any kind of like real capital markets there that are risk taking. Has I mean, there been a lot of exits where there's a lot of angels there? Non-competes so, too, John. There's still non-competes in the East Coast. That's going to be um, it right and, there. And, and they're enforced. I think they're going to go away. I think that's that's definitely a factor. I mean, look at Facebook was started in Cambridge, Mass. Right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what would have happened to Facebook if it didn't move to California? They wouldn't have got funded. Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't have hit that that escape velocity that it Charles uh, Zazeski from Cloudera, former Cloudera, he's got his own company now. He met he met to Halligan at MIT in 2003. He wanted to build his career in Boston. He moves after two years, he he moves to San Francisco. 
I mean, that's basically, it's like if you're a professional player, you go where the professionals are, right? And that's the, that's the Bay Area. But I mean, you know, EMC was an incredibly successful company. Um, you know, it, it eclipsed the size of digital, which which was, you know, huge back in the day. But you couldn't spin out companies out of EMC. Remember when Donatelli tried to leave EMC or he did leave EMC, he went to HP? What do you, what happened? EMC sued him because he had a non-compete. So he couldn't work in storage for a full year. And I'm, so he his hands were tied. So he moved to California. And you know, is, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna post this thread on the show notes and I'll send it to you, Dave. Um, some people we all know on here. So Chris Ye has a comment. I've known Chris Ridge Palo Alto guy. He's he going to get your reaction to this. He says, Boston and Revers the past. The, the Pilgrims, Harvard, Celtic, Sox, Paul Revere. The Bay Area only cares about the future. 97% of entrepreneurs here don't even know what Netscape was. Well. That's kind know, of true, actually. I mean, I, I, I mean, I hate to have to be in the position of, def I mean, look, there's still a great place, you know, New England's great place to live. There's still a very vibrant economy. It's beautiful, and, you know, despite the weather back and forth. But, and there's, you know, there's good capital markets here. It's just, it's just, you go to Silicon Valley. I've been there a thousand times. You live there. It's just a different vibe. Everybody's, mm -hmm. it's like being in LA with everybody's got a screenplay. In Silicon Valley, everybody's got a business plan. And yeah. it's just not the way here, you know, here the mindset is, okay, how do I get a good job making decent bank? You know, how do I make, you know, two, 300 grand a year, you know, get a nice house, have a family, move, out, move have a family, move outside of the 128 belt, maybe, or maybe I can afford to move it, whatever bank, you know, grow my 401k and, and, you know, retire reasonably comfortable. Silicon Valley is totally different. It's like, all right, how do we create a rocket ship? How do we take a risk? Let's quit our jobs. Let's start a yeah. company. I mean, that's, you know, totally, it's totally everybody, it's, right? Yeah, it, well, it's not everybody, but the thing is it is more risk-taking, but I think you're right about the whole LA Hollywood thing. I always said that, you know, being an entrepreneur moving out here, I've been that person. And when you don't, when you don't have a business plan that's getting funded, you're essentially the equivalent of, in Hollywood, if you don't have a film, you're bartending. You're trying to make your next gig. Yeah, you act right. Gotta, exactly. I'm bartending, working parties. You got to pay the bills. The, and so ho Hollywood has that dynamic. I'm, I'm an actor. I'm, I'm bartending. I'm not yet on the big time. Here in Silicon Valley, the equivalent bartending is called consulting. <laughs> I'm a cons I got a consulting gig. So when you're not building, you're consulting. That's like the bartender role. You know, you got to make some cash. You do some consulting until you get that funding. Uh, and not a lot of people hit that. A lot of churn it? to it. A lot of churn in Silicon Valley as well, and, too. And it, and of course, I didn't even mention Seattle. I mean, you, you got Microsoft, you got Amazon, you know, obviously Starbucks. But I mean, you put, got to put that right up there. I mean, in, in the DNA uh, up up in the Northwest. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of well, interesting that those two companies that are so massive are not Silicon Valley, but people kind of consider them Silicon Valley extended, right? Microsoft well, I, I think, you know, we'll talk about this on another pod. We'll put this for next week, but let's let's put this on the pod for next week and we'll dig into this. I believe, and we've talked about this day privately, we'll share it publicly. There's going to be hub and spoke model around entrepreneurship. You're yeah. starting to see Silicon Valley kind of getting syndicated in the sense of the formula is pre-identified. Good universities, good talent, good economic, good good angels and VCs, risk-taking culture vibe. You'll start to see a hub and spoke. And I think the digital connected points is going to be interesting with virtual hybrid. You're going to start to see points of presence of entrepreneurship hubs connected. So an entrepreneur can be anywhere in the world and still get the benefits of Silicon Valley through their network. So I think you're going to start to see new networks emerge. And I think you're going to start to see a different landscape over the next 10 years, especially as this AI movement goes on with virtual companies being more prevalent, you'll see hubs of entrepreneurship. Well, and, and it's going to be connected. So uh, that uh, backbone, I think it's going to be the cube, the cube global, what we want to do. You'll see us have new cubes everywhere. That's going to be something we're going to do. I think the, the, it's, it started early days. The crypto was a real signal there. And when you and I were on the crypto circuit, we met a lot of people who were like, literally gave up their U S citizenship, moved out of the country. They said, we don't need, I don't need a U.S. citizenship. Right. And I don't want the U S government, you know, coming after my crypto, you know, yeah. crypto, crypto multimillionaires that said, I'm out of here. So, <laughs> they all moved to Puerto Rico because there's no taxes. But guess what? All of a sudden, oh, Miami's a hotbed. I wonder why. It's only a short boat ride from Puerto yeah, Rico exactly. to but Miami. You saw a lot of people move to uh, you know, other places right? Um, in, in Eastern Europe. And so, 
You're right. I had, a, you mean you I had, an, I had an entrepreneur tell me that Miami is a complete overhyped environment. It's not even close to being what they're billing it to be. Uh, I haven't been, I haven't checked it out yet, so I'm going to hold my judgment. But the scuttlebutt is Miami, pff, no, not not happening. Good weather and a lot of wealthy people move there because there's no state taxes. I mean, that's you know, yeah. but uh, well, Austin's know. got no state taxes, but that's booming. All right, Dave, we got a couple minutes left here. Let's get into some some of the rants. Um, uh, and 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 what you're looking at, obviously, we got SBB um, debacle continuing. You're seeing the tech companies laying off a ton of people. Amazon, nine thousand more. Accenture is putting as it's just announced twelve thousand people are gone. Um, more startups being funded in Chat GPT than ever before. Younger, smarter, system oriented. Um, landscape's changing. What's your rant? Or take well, on all this. You know, the, the irony of S SVB is that what killed them essentially was, was the ability to do mobile banking. You could take money out instantly. And they were this close to actually getting a lifeline. But everybody in the East Coast went home. <laughs> and the West Coast was too slow. And so the mobile banking, you know, the users, the depositors could move money out faster than SVB could bring it in. And so, you know, it comes, it all to me, it all comes back to the Fed. Fed has a really hard job, but they have become the sole arbiter of economic activity. And I guess my rant is because Congress is useless and they can't legislate because they got the far left and the far right. And they it's got it's like galactic stupidity and it's bad for the country. They 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 don't put country first. That's all a bunch of BS and they can't get legislation done. So as a result, the Fed is is like the only lever when they can use their whether it's quantitative easing or now they're raising interest rates and they're tightening or they're injecting liquidity into the system by by basically you know giving you know at par loans to these banks that are that are failing and the reality is and you look back you and I met in 2010 and that was the start of the greatest bull market you know boom in my lifetime and by 2012 the markets the Fed should have been able to step back and said, okay, markets, you can operate. But the Fed, which is supposed to be an independent entity, they've kowtowed to presidents, hedge fund managers, bank CEOs, other big money interests, and the wealth gap is widening. And that's bad for the working class. It's bad for the economy. And I think it's yeah. bad for the country. And the problem is we're now drowning in debt. You know, I mean, we're, uh, the unfunded debt is going to approach a hundred trillion this year. And now we've, We've wasted a, a great opportunity, and that's a shame. But I think the answer is staring us in the face, um, and, and I think that answer is we got to have you know better fiscal discipline. You know, going to raise taxes a little bit, not so much that it kills the economy. And you got to adjust defense spending. You got to figure out Medicare and Social Security. Hit the wealthy; they can afford it. And you got to get back to you know a stable economy where your your debt is not 120% of GDP. Yeah, I totally agree. I think we are in, we're in trouble. Um my rant I'm not not so much as on point on the Fed there, but I do agree with you. I think to me this week rant is points to the the the, the dots connecting around TikTok, our previous conversation about national security, um this next generation um upon us, our government. And I think my rant is all, all that you said, and I would add that it just seems like it's broken. The government's broken, and the and this next generation technology uh, transparency has to put in play. And I think the weaponization of our system through incompetence and just malpractice. You know, what you can't have courts doing things on behalf of activists. You can't have, um, you know, spying. If the if the rules have changed in warfare or geopolitical, they got to be reset. I think I think we're feeling that right now. So my rant is, people should need to wake up, not in a conspiracy theory way, but more in a like common sense way. Like, hey, if TikTok, everyone's using TikTok in the U.S. and they like it, we'll fix it. <laughs> Or kill it. You can't just kill it, right? So that's easy. And then, you know, this, the government, you know, the questioning points out this whole generational shift. So you know, to me, my rant is the generations have to step up and make make changes and and force change and figure that out. And that's, I think, some sort of revolution in, in our system that helps people are, are you know, live in a, in a free country uh, and have commerce that's profitable for businesses. Um, and everything's connected. Um, the banking thing, that's a whole nother wall game. We'll continue to watch that. And again, my rant is the uh, the startups are coming on board like we predicted. 
So the game is changing. The nuclear winter is in place. It's happening. What comes out of this? What's the fertilizer? Every downturn is like fertilizer for the next spring. Uh, uprising of startups and innovation. What will change? That's the question. That's my rant. Yeah, John, I mean, great points and, and perspectives as always. I, I love these these cube pods. I mean, uh, it's, you know, we have so much to share. We have such a great community and so many, you know, kind of inbound data points. It's uh, it's, yeah. it's a pleasure to the be digital, able to It's a digital them. world, Dave. Digital world. Uh, that's our pod five. We got bunch of events coming up um and be going to kubecon in amsterdam i'll be there you're going to vegas uh for an event um we got rsa coming up we got the security show um, yeah, a lot of things world. happening a lot of things going on in our world right now and i think again it's going to be interesting to see how the tech world survives and will it be a tailwind uh the definitely i'm excited about how video is continuing to boom um is is growing I'm excited to see that People are waking up to organic, transparent conversations, you know, not just paid media. I think media is learning that the game's changed, seeing good startups getting funded from in media that are AI oriented. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm bullish on that. So we'll, we'll pick yeah, that up another time. Uh, me too. I think it's going to, eventually it's going to be a productivity boom and it's going to be directly related yeah. to, to automation and AI. I, I don't know. I can't predict when. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's going to show up in the numbers within the, certainly within this decade. And that's well, gonna... one one thing we'll talk about next week is that the whole world is going super cloud and super apps, Dave. That's happening. And ChatGPT is a super app. Everyone's that's afraid no of it. Question. All yeah. right. That's our pod. Thanks for listening. And again, give us feedback on Twitter. We're going to start bringing guests in from our Cube Alumni Network to bring in some color commentary. Start to get some more structure around the topics. Right now, we're just going to break down three or four areas and just riff and share what, what's on our mind. And again, if you have any ideas for guests, let us know. I'm at Furrier on Twitter, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, all channels are open. Dave's Dave Vellante. Thanks for listening and, and reach out to us. Thank you.